Welcome back to Physics 191. I'm Gerard Blanchard. We'll pick up where we left off last time. Last time I introduced the idea of a kinematic situation, meaning a motion situation. And how do you identify a kinematic situation? A kinematic, kinematic situation deals with acceleration, velocity, or position, and time. The time, the time is important. If you, if there, if you see time dependence in a situation, then you know that you're dealing with a kinematic situation. The general equation, the starting equation, or I should say the first of four starting equations for kinematic situations, is our relationship that we talked about between acceleration and velocity. And that is that acceleration is equal to the change in velocity over change in time or better said, the acceleration vector is equal to the change in the velocity vector over the change in time. And since that's a vector equation, that's actually two equations, an x component equation and a y component equation. So the acceleration in the x direction is equal to the change in the x component of the velocity divided by the change in time, or acceleration in the x direction is equal to the vx final minus vx initial, all divided by t final minus t initial. And we have the same thing with y, same equation with y. And remember that a situation can be kinematic, non-equilibrium, and equilibrium all at the same time. So you could have three different equations, starting three different starting equations, so you can solve for three unknowns. Let's put that to use. Let's describe a situation that is a kinematic situation. If a pronghorn antelope accelerates from rest in a straight line with a constant acceleration of 1.7 meters per second squared, how long does it take for the antelope to reach a speed of 22 meters per second? So we have, we're told that the antelope has an acceleration of 1.7 meters per second and we're, we're told that it goes from rest so starting from zero a velocity of zero meters per second up to a velocity of, two point, of 22 meters per second so we have a change in velocity a change in time and an acceleration those are all the symbols of a kinematic situation. So please try to answer this question using your kinematic equations. Okay, first step, as always, draw a diagram. We'll start off, start off by drawing our x-axis, and then y would be vertical. We're not going to need y, but I just put it in for completeness. Um, the antelope, there's our square antelope, starts from rest. So we know that that is Vx initial is equal to zero meters per second. We got that from start from rest. We can also choose to make the initial time t equal to zero. We can choose wherever to start our stopwatch. So that would make t initial equal to zero seconds. So that's our initial situation. That's what we're starting from. Then the antelope accelerates. And at some later time, t final is equal to, we don't know, that's what we're looking for, vx final is equal to 22 meters per second. And we know that in the meantime, the antelope was accelerating in the x direction 
with 1.7 meters per second squared. Now, could I have made that my y-axis? Sure. Your choice of axes is also up to you. Um, just for convenience sake, I chose to make the straight line that the antelope is accelerating in the x-axis. At this point, we've gotten all of the information out of the statement of the exercise. We have all of our knowns and unknowns, and we have to recognize that we have a change in velocity, a change in time and acceleration. This is a kinematic situation, and we will use our starting equation. There are actually four kinematic equations. We haven't gotten to all of them, so there's only one. So we know that it will have to be AX is equal to VX final minus VX initial over T final minus T initial. That's our starting equation. That's our only one so far. So now we can start putting in what we know into this equation. We know that AX is 1.7. And for this first time, I'll leave in the units so you can see how the units work out. 1.7 meters per second squared is equal to VX final, 22 meters per second minus VX initial, zero meters per second, divided by T final, which is what we want to know, so I'll just leave it as T final, minus T initial, which is zero seconds. Okay, slide that up a little bit, and we have 1.7 meters per second squared. 22 meters per second minus 0 meters per second is just going to be 22 meters per second. And T final minus 0 seconds is just going to be T final. We have to solve this equation for T final. Well, we'll multiply both sides by T final. And we'll divide both sides by 1.7 meters per second squared. And 1.7 meters per second squared divided by 1.7 meters per second squared is just the number 1. And we're multiplying by 1, so we don't actually have to write the 1. And T final divided by T final is also 1. So we can leave that out of our equation. And we have T final is equal to 22 meters per second divided by 1.7 meters per second squared. So that gives us T final is equal to 22 divided by 7. I'm sorry, 22 divided by 1.7, which is 12.9. And what are our units? Well, when you divide by a fraction, when you have a fraction in the denominator of an equation, you can multiply by its inverse. So second squared per meter, second squared per meter, I'm sorry, multiply and divide by its inverse. Um, second squared per meter divided by second squared per meter, that is just 1. So we, all we've done there is we've multiplied by 1. We're still okay. And then we have meters divided by meters, second squared divided by second squared. Everything in the denominator is equal to 1. And what do we have in the numerator? We have meters divided by meters, and seconds squared divided by seconds, which just leaves us with seconds. So, as we would expect, the time comes out in units of seconds, or the answer is 12.9 seconds. 
And once again, as I said before, if you're working in basic metric units, your answers will always come out in basic metric units. So since I started with my quantities all in basic metric units, meters per second squared, meters per second, seconds, meters per second, I knew that my answer, my final answer for time, would also have to come out in basic metric units, which are seconds. So, as I suggest, always convert to basic metric units, and then we, can, we don't have to write in our units into our equations, which will make things a little bit less cluttered and hopefully avoid some mistakes. Okay, so the final answer, 12.9 seconds. Let's work another example. In this question, a particle experiences a constant acceleration that is north at 100 meters per second squared. At t equals zero, its velocity vector is 60 meters per second east. At what time will the magnitude of the velocity be 100 meters per second? Think about that, and uh, let's see what, draw your diagram, list your knowns and unknowns, and think about what type of situation this is, and let's see what you can do with that. Okay, as always, let's draw our diagram. Here is east and north. Well, I will write this as I will make east be my x-axis and north be my y-axis. We have a particle. It doesn't tell us where it is to begin with, so let's just put it at the origin. Actually, it really doesn't matter. But what we do know is that at t is equal to zero, so that would be our initial time, t initial is equal to zero seconds. We know that it is moving 60 meters per second east. 60 meters per second east. So that tells us that it's moving in the x direction initially. So vx initial is 60 meters per second. How fast is it moving in y initially? Well, it's not moving at all in y. Its initial velocity vector isn't pointed in y at all. So vy initial is 0 meters per second. So it starts off moving in the x direction. We're told that it has an acceleration that's northward at 100 meters per second. So I will draw in the acceleration northward. And that is in the y direction. So Ay is 100 meters per second squared. And if that's its total velocity, we know that Ax will be equal to 0 meters per second squared. So even though the particle is not moving in the, in the y direction to begin with, it will start moving in the y direction. So its motion will look something like this. It will start off with zero velocity in the y direction, but it will gain some y velocity, so it will also start moving in y. So finally, we don't know the time, so t final is equal to zero. We know 
that the magnitude of the velocity, so that would be v, which is equal to the square root of vx squared plus vy squared, is equal to 100 meters per second. And that is everything that we were given in the statement of the exercise. We've completely analyzed and modeled, well, we haven't completely modeled the situation yet because we don't have our starting equations, but we've completely analyzed the statement of the exercise. And these are all of our knowns and unknowns. And I made a mistake here. I wrote t final is equal to zero that should actually be t final is a question mark. That's what we're looking for. So t final is our unknown. Okay, what do we do? Well, you might look at this and say, I don't know. This is, this is very complicated. I've never seen anything like this before. I don't know what to do. Well, you do know. You, know, you do know what the next step is. The next step is to write down our starting equation. Well, actually, the next step is to identify the type of situation that we have. We have a change in velocity, we have a change in time, and we have acceleration, so we know that this is a kinematic situation. It's a kinematic situation, so we have to use our kinematic starting equations. And we only have one kinematic starting equation so far, and that is that the acceleration vector, and I'll write it up here, acceleration vector is equal to change in velocity vector over change in time. And being a, being a vector equation, that is actually two equations, two component equations, and that would be AX is equal to VX final minus VX initial over T final minus T initial. And AY is equal to VY final minus VY initial over T final minus T initial. Now we have completely modeled the the situation that we're given. We have a complete mathematical model of the situation. Now all that's left is to make our equation specific to the situation and to work through them and see what comes out. And believe it or not, the answer is in there somewhere. As complicated as this looks, the answer is in there if you follow this procedure. Let's start with our x equation. Ax we know is zero. So zero is equal to vx final, which we don't know, minus vx initial, which we do know. We do know that vx initial is 60 meters per second divided by t final, which we don't know, minus t initial which is zero. Well, this is helpful because we, let's work through it a little bit more. We have zero is equal to vx final minus 60 divided by t final minus zero is just t final. I can multiply both sides by t final. t final divided by t final is one t final times zero is zero. So zero is equal to vx final minus 60, which tells us that vx final is equal to, oops, 60. vx final is equal to 60. Or in other words, vx final doesn't change at all because there is no acceleration in the x direction. And this is going to be very important later on when we get to a class of situations that we're going to call projectile situations uh, or free fall, projectile or free fall. 
Um, there is, projectile and free fall are actually just a subclass of kinematic equations, but the important thing is if the acceleration in the x direction is zero, then the x component of the velocity doesn't change. It was 60 to begin with, it's 60 to end with. We can take that and we can go back to what we know about the velocity. And here, we were told that the magnitude of the velocity is 100 meters per second. The magnitude of the velocity has an, is the square root of vx squared plus vy squared. Well, now we know vx squared, so we can calculate vy squared. And I'll do that right here. We have the square root of vx squared plus vy squared is equal to 100. I'll square both sides. vx squared plus vy squared is equal to 100 squared. vx squared is 60 squared plus vy squared is equal to 100 squared. Or vy squared is equal to 100 squared minus 60 squared, subtracted 60 squared from both sides, or vy squared is equal to the square root of 100 squared minus 60 squared. I'm sorry, that should, that should be vy is equal to the square root of 100 squared minus 60 squared, since I took the square root of both sides and that is Vy is equal to what? 100 squared minus 60 squared. Take the square root and that gives us 80. So Vy final it should be v, that's Vy final because we're talking about the final situation. Vy final is 80 meters per second. And we'll use that in our y equation, which we have right here. Let's see what happens when we start working with our y equation. Ay, we know, is 100 meters per second squared is equal to Vy final, which we know now, 80 minus Vy initial, which is zero, divided by T final, which is what we're looking for, minus zero, T initial. And we see that our only unknown in that equation is T final. Uh, we can multiply both sides by t final, divide both sides by 100, and we have t final is equal to 80 divided by 100, or t final is equal to 0 0.800 seconds. So the, the answer to the question we were asked is t final is 0.8 seconds. And this goes to show how no matter how complicated the situation that we're given is, this is a very complicated situation, we can answer it using our procedure. Draw the diagram, list our knowns and unknowns, and then the very important thing, identify the type of situation and write down the starting equation for that type of situation. It may seem hopelessly complicated, but the answer is in there somewhere. If you've properly modeled the situation and you, and you use proper algebra, then you will get the right answer. The right answer is in there. Let's work another example. This question asks, an engine pulls a train of 20 freight cars, each having a mass of 50 times 10 to the 4 kilograms with a constant force. The cars move from rest 
to a speed of 4.0 meters per second squared in 2.0 seconds on a straight track. Neglecting friction, what is the force with which the 10th car pulls on the 11th one, which means in the middle of the train? Okay, we have a kinematic situation because we have we have a change in velocity and a change in time. We know that that's a kinematic situation, but we're also talking about force. So we're going to, we know that this is also going to be a non-equilibrium situation. So we know we have a kinematic situation coupled with a non-equilibrium situation. The important thing is going to be how we draw our diagram. So please try to draw your diagram, list all your knowns and unknowns, and write down your starting equations and see what you can do with this one. Okay, we'll draw our x-axis. We said we, the statement said that the train was moving in a straight line. So we'll draw a straight line and we'll call that our x-axis. Now we have to ask ourselves, what is the object of interest? What is the object to which we're going to apply all of our equations? Well, we're asked what is the force on the back of the train, on the on the back half of the train. So that is our object of interest. And I'll label it B for the back half of the train. We know that that's 10 cars because the we're asked for the force on the 10th car. I'm sorry, we're asked for the force on the 11th car well, the, if the 11th car moves, everything behind it will move as well. So the force that is applied to the 11th car is also applied to all the cars behind it. So we have 10 cars at the back. The mass is equal to 10 cars times 5 times 10 to the 4 kilograms for each car. or the mass is 5 times 10 to the 5 kilograms. That is the mass of the entire back half of the car. Oh, I'm sorry, the back half of the train. We know that the back half of the train is initially at rest, so T initial is 0, Vx initial is equal to zero, zero seconds, zero meters per second. So we know that we're in our basic metric units. And we know that the train accelerates to T final. At T final is equal to 20 seconds. We know that V X final is 4 meters per second. And the acceleration, AX, is an unknown, as is the force that is applied to the back half of the train. So at this point, we have diagrammed our situation. We've drawn all of our knowns and unknowns. And it's time to identify the situation. Well, we have a change in velocity and a change in time. We know that it's a kinematic situation. But we also know that we're dealing with forces and we're dealing with a 
we're dealing with forces and acceleration in the x direction. So since the train is not at rest, it it's initially at rest, but it doesn't stay at rest, we know that we're dealing with a non-equilibrium situation in the x direction. So it would be x non-equilibrium. Our starting equation for kinematics is going to be ax is equal to vx final minus vx initial over t final minus t initial. And our starting equation for x non-equilibrium is going to be ax is equal to force total x over mass. Notice that we have the same ax in here in both, in both equations, and that's going to tie our equations together, and that's going to help us answer what we're, what we're asked for. Well, let's start with the kinematic equation. We have ax, we don't know, ax is equal to vx final, vx final is 4 meters per second, now just, I won't write my units, minus vx initial, which is 0 meters per second, divided by t final, which is 20 seconds, minus t initial, which is 0, or I have ax is equal to 4 over 20, which is 0 0.2 meters per second squared. So we found our, the acceleration of the train. That's going to be useful when we go to our x non-equilibrium situation. What is ax? We just found that out. ax is 0 0.2 meters per second squared, and that's equal to the total force in the x direction on the back half of the train, and that would be what we're looking for. That's our f divided by the mass of the back half of the train, which is 5 times 10 to the 5. And we see that our only unknown here is the force. So we multiply both sides by 5 times 10 to the 5, and we have 0 0.2 times 5 times 10 to the 5 is equal to the force and that would be 1 times 10 to the 5 is equal to the force. 1 times 10 to the 5 what units? Well, our basic metric unit of force is newtons. We've been working in basic metric units, so we know that that's 1 times 10 to the 5 newtons is the force with which the force that's being applied to the 11th car or in other words, the force is being applied to the entire back half of the train. And that answers our question. Let's go a little bit more into how did I know that the back half of the train was the object that we should be considering. Let me draw another diagram here. And let's let this be car 11. Car 11 is attached to car 12. Car 12 is attached to car 13, and so on. We were, what we were asked for was what was the force that was applied to the 11th car? Well, if we were to consider the 11th car by itself, then we would have to consider not only the force being applied to the right on the 11th car, but we would also have to consider the force with which the rest of the train pulls on the 11th car. So we would actually have two forces on the 11th car, and our equa we, we would have more unknowns than we have equations. Well, what we would have to do is we'd have to consider the 12th car and so on until we got to the very back of the train where we have the 20th car that's not pulling on anything. 
Well, what I can do to make there only be one force that we're considering is I can make my object that I'm considering be the entire back half of the train. So I can treat the entire back half of the train as one object, and then all of these internal forces, the 11th car pulling on the 12th and the 12th pulling on the 11th, 12th pulling on 13, 13 pulling on 12, and so on, are all become internal forces which we don't have to consider. So if we consider the entire back half of the train, there's only one force, the force on the 11th car, and then we can answer the question. Remember when we looked at the horse and the sleigh, the forces on the object depend on how we group the object. In, in the case of the horse pulling on the sleigh, if we considered the horse and the sleigh as a unit, we didn't have to worry about the internal forces of the horse pulling on the sleigh or the sleigh pulling on the horse. So by grouping as my object the entire back half of the train, there's only one force to consider, and that was the force that we're asked for. Let's work one more exercise. This question states, A brick of mass one kilogram slides down an icy roof inclined at 30 degrees with respect to the horizontal. If the brick starts from rest, how fast is it moving 0.9 seconds later? Ignore friction. Well, we're going to have to draw a diagram. Try drawing your diagram. And remember how we dealt with equilibrium situations with uh, inclined planes. And that will give you a hint as to how to draw your axes. You have to draw in all of your forces and draw in your knowns and unknowns. And then you have to identify the type of situation that we have. We have a change in velocity and a change in time that tells us it's going to be a kinematic equation. But using the kinematic equation by itself, that's not going to give you enough information to solve uh, for what's being asked. So you're going to have to consider the forces and your non-equilibrium equations in order to answer this question. So get started. Try. Draw a diagram. Draw in your forces. List your knowns and unknowns. Write down your starting equations. And, and think about it. Okay, let's draw our diagram. I'm going to draw it big so that we can see everything that's going on here. There's a lot going on here. We have a brick that slides down an icy roof. So there's our brick sliding down the icy roof. This is our initial situation, T initial, T final. Notice that when we have kinematic situations, we uh, always have an initial and a starting situation. So we have to draw the object twice, where what it's doing at the beginning and what it's doing at the end. T initial, we'll start our stopwatch at zero, so that makes T final 0 0.9 seconds. Um, v initial, we're told that the brick starts from rest, so V initial is zero meters per second. Um, how fast is it moving later? V final? We don't know. And as I said, we will have to consider the forces on the brick, so let's draw those in. We have the brick's weight which is its mass times g. Our weight is 1 times 9.80 newtons per kilogram. Or the weight is 9.8 newtons. 
9.80 newtons of force. Um, what other forces do we have on the brick? Well, we have the normal force. The normal force on the brick. And any other forces? No. No more forces acting on the brick. So we've drawn in our forces. We've drawn in our initial position, our final position. We're told that the roof is inclined at 30 degrees. And at this point, we've completed our diagram. We've drawn in all of our, well, we haven't completed our diagram. We've gotten the information that we can out of the, out of the statement. We have not yet drawn in our axes. Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, as we did before, tilt the page so that the brick is moving in the X direction. And I'm going to do something a little bit unusual. I'm going to actually draw my X axis pointing to the left. Normally it points to the right, but as I happen to have drawn this diagram, the brick is moving in the is moving to the left. Uh, it would be a lot simpler just to make that our um, make make our x-axis point in the direction of the motion. I could just as easily have drawn the the brick sloping down to the right, in which case our x-axis would be to the right. But this just goes to show that you have the freedom to pick the direction of the x-axis. Y is going to be vertical. And now we see that we have to break weight up into X and Y components. We have to break it up into a horizontal and a vertical component. Let's get an angle. We have a, let me tilt it back a little bit. We have a right triangle right here. If this is 30 degrees, then this angle up here must be 60 degrees. And I'm going to tilt back one more time. This side is our weight X, which is equal to weight adjacent to the angle. So the weight adjacent to the angle is pointing in the positive X direction as we've drawn our X axis. Our Y axis is uh, um, our, our, our weight opposite the angle is in the negative y direction, so weight y would be minus weight opposite. Okay. Now we have completely gotten everything that we can out of the problem statement. We've drawn our diagram. We identify our situation. Our situation is a kinematic situation. We have motion in the X direction that changes with time. So we have kinematic. We have an X kinematic situation. And also the object starts at rest but doesn't remain at rest. So we know that we have a non-equilibrium situation, at least in the X direction, since the brick moves in the X direction. So we have X non-equilibrium. Our starting equation for X kinematic is AX is equal to VX final minus VX initial over T final minus T initial. Let's see what we can do with that. AX, we don't know. VX final, we also don't know. Minus VX initial. That's zero, divided by T final, we know that, that's 0 0.9 seconds, minus T initial, which is zero, or we have, I'll, mul I'll multiply both sides by 0 0.9, and we have 0 0.9, sorry, that was off the screen, we go over that again. AX is VX final minus zero divided by 0 0.9 minus zero. Multiplying both sides by 0 0.9 tells us 0 0.9 times AX 
is equal to Vx final. So, if we knew Ax, we could answer the question and say, what is Vx final? Well, how do we do Ax? How do we find Ax? Well, that's going to come from our x non-equilibrium situation. An x non-equilibrium equation, I'm sorry. And that would be Ax is equal to force total x divided by mass or Ax is equal to the total force in the x direction on the brick minus the mass. Well, what forces do we have in the x direction? The normal force is in the positive y direction, not in x at all. Weight, however, is pulling in x and y, so we need weight adjacent. So Ax is equal to the weight adjacent to the angle divided by the mass, which happened to be one kilogram. Or Ax is equal to weight adjacent, which would be weight times the cosine of theta divided by one. Or Ax is equal to the weight of 9.8 newtons times the cosine of the angle 60. Or Ax is equal to 9.8 times cosine of 60, 4.9 newtons and now we have Ax and we can bring that over here and solve for Vx final. So 0 0.9 times 4.9 is equal to Vx final or Point 0.9 times 4.9 equals 4.41 equals Vx final. We know what our basic metric units are, so that'd be 4.4 meters per second is equal to Vx final. And, and that is what we're asked for. So once again, as complicated as this may seem, it's a matter of drawing a complete diagram, getting all of your knowns and unknowns correctly identifying the situation, and working your algebra correctly. That's the procedure that we're going to use all along, and uh, the answer is in there somewhere. So try, work hard, and you'll be able to answer these questions. That's it for now. Until next time, think physics.